One thing I noticed and one thing I could tell straight away as soon as I arrived, besides the busy roads and the bustling markets, is that this is a place of peace. And what's amazing about this place is that how there are so many people from so many different backgrounds and even different religions and that they can all live together in tranquility and in peace. And this is very important, especially for the times which we live in, when we see that war and turmoil and trouble and fitna seems to be spreading all around the world. Everybody should be looking at this example of Kerala as an example of peace. And one of the reasons you have so much peace is because you are followers of the messenger of peace, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so what we see in this beautiful community of yours, this community of Kerala, is we see an example and a tradition which goes back all the way to the ones who gazed at the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and who gave their hands in allegiance and bay'ah and pledge to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a land who was blessed with the feet of the Sahaba, of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This land where we are now, this is a blessing from Allah. The likes of Sayyidina Malik ibn Dinar, the likes of Sayyidina Tamim al-Ansari. Subhanallah, these great Sahaba, these great shining stars who are examples for us. And what we see in this land is that when they came, they came with this message of salam, this message of peace. And the way that Islam was introduced to this land, there are beautiful lessons for many to take from this. And in fact, the whole Muslim ummah, rather the whole world should look at the example which this, these people set. And what we can see is when they came, they dealt with the people with hikmah. They dealt with the people with generosity. They dealt with the people with mercy. And all these characteristics which we see in the shama'il of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa These people were representatives of the Messenger of Allah, Nabi al-Rahmah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so what we see is that the way they interacted with people is that they showed respect for these people. And they understood the context which they were in and they respected the customs of the locals. So much so that when we go today to visit some of the earliest masajid, some of the earliest mosques in this land, we see them and the architecture of them was uh, coherent and was in harmony with the architecture of the locals. To this extent, these people weren't here to take over. These people weren't here to defeat the people here. These people were here to invite everybody to go to Jannah and have the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And so the country where I come from, the United Kingdom in England, likewise we have a similar situation in where we have many different people from many different ethnic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, all in one island in the middle of the sea. And they have to live together. There's no other option. The only other option is chaos. And we cannot accept this. And what we see in our country is that because we have this multiculturalism, multiculturalism brings with it challenges. And usually these challenges are started from and come from people who are ignorant. So the solution to this ignorance and the solution to the challenges which we face has to be in knowledge. And as we know, Allah Most High tells us in the Quran that He created us different people and different tribes so that we may know each other. Not so we may fight each other and cause problems with each other and try and send each other to the graves. And so what we see in the UK, for example, in my city of Liverpool, is that there is great respect amongst the people of different religions. For example, the Church of England in the UK and the Muslim community, they're very, very active in interfaith dialogue, in talking with each other, in having relations, in trying to understand more about each other and also solving problems together whenever they arise from within the communities. Some examples we can see also from Liverpool in my city is that once every year 
There is a service in the Liverpool Cathedral. The Liverpool Cathedral is a huge building. In fact, in terms of length, it is the largest cathedral, the longest cathedral in Europe. And I was invited to an annual service in the cathedral, which is called the Judges' Service. And the concept of this is actually a beautiful concept. Because what they do every year, they invite all the leaders of the region of Merseyside and all the high judges within society who preside over all the court cases in Merseyside. And the tradition is to remind them of their creator, to remind them of the importance of justice and equity. And what happened was that in my capacity as the Muslim chaplain to the High Sheriff of Merseyside, I was invited to stand on the pulpit in Liverpool Cathedral. The pulpit usually is where the Christian religious sermons are given from. And I was invited to share ayat, verses from the Quran al kareem which describe the justice in Islam. Speaking to this gathering of high judges in Merseyside and speaking to all the civil leaders. So this is how far we've got in the closeness and the cooperation between us. In our mosques in Liverpool and all around the UK, we regularly invite priests and representatives and religious leaders from many different faith backgrounds into our masajid to learn about Islam and to benefit from each other. We also have examples where Muslims are setting the example for people in the rest of society. And one short story, I'll share it with you. We recently opened a new masjid just before Ramadan last year. And I request everybody to make dua for this masjid and all the people who are involved in serving there. And in this masjid, it is in an area in where not many non-Muslims live. Not many Muslims live. The whole area is predominantly non-Muslim. And so all of a sudden, all of these people were coming to pray in an area where there were not many Muslims. And in fact, we received an email from one of the neighbors. And the email was quite harsh. And he was saying, who do you think you are, you Muslims? I can't sleep at night because when I open up my window, all I can hear is the sound of you singing in your temple. What he meant is the taraweeh, the Quran in taraweeh. I don't know any of you. I don't know who you are. And the email was quite harsh. But what this man didn't realize is that we as a community had already planned to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And we planned to give a gift to every, every single house in the whole area. And two days after we implemented this plan. And we bought a box of chocolates for every single neighbor in the whole area. Hundreds and hundreds of boxes of chocolates. And we sent volunteers to their doors to knock and to give them this gift. Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, Give gifts and you will love each other. Give gifts and you will love each other. And so two days after, another email comes to the mosque from the same man. He thought we would bought the chocolates just because of his complaint. But he didn't know we were already trying to bring life to the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And in this email, he completely changed his tone. He said, I'm really sorry about my previous email. I want to apologize. I think really you are nice people. And I would love to be involved in serving your masjid and helping you serve the rest of the community in any way I can. Look at the beauty of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Give a small gift and you will see the difference. And so what we have, Alhamdulillah, is this interfaith dialogue, which is very important for us. We have communication and we have gatherings and we have events between different people from different faiths. And what we find here in Kerala also are amazing examples for the whole world in the efforts which are carried out by, for example, the Ma'adin Academy, and the many other organizations, and by Sayyid al-Sheikh Ibrahim al-Khalil al-Bukhari, and Sayyid al-Sheikh also Abu Bakr Ahmad, and all these righteous people who are taking up so much effort in this land. And what you don't realize is this effort is being invested so we do not have any chaos in society. We don't want trouble in society. 
The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa did not want trouble when he entered into Mecca. So he spoke and he interacted with the people of other faiths. Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab did not want trouble in society in Jerusalem. And so he interacted with the people of other faiths. And we have the famous covenant from Sayyidina Umar. Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih did not want trouble in society when he entered into the lands of Europe. And we have the firman of Sultan Ahmed al-Fatih, the conqueror, which he gave to the Bosnian Franciscan monks, which promised and took an oath by Allah that not a single Muslim will harm any person, any church, any place of worship, and they will not even offend you with their, with their tongues. This is the importance which Islam gives to human beings. To human beings. And unfortunately, we have come distant from this message. And so what we see in these examples are not just examples where Muslims are a minority who are working closely with people of other faiths, but also where Muslims are a majority, the respect and the rights which they afford to people of other faiths. What we do find, however, is that people whose Iman is strong, people whose Iman is firm, people of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, they do not feel threatened by people of other faiths. But what happens is when our faith becomes weak, and when we deviate from the true message and the true teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, this is when we have problem with people of other faiths. And this is when we want to fight them. And this is when we want to kill them. And this is when we want to cause chaos and catastrophes in societies like we see in many parts of the Muslim world today. The reason for this is weakness in faith. Because the strong people of faith, the men of Allah, their iman is not shaken. It does not move. The waves of fitna do not affect it. They stand firm. And for this reason, they can reach out to everybody in society. One of the reasons also people tend to be against or dislike interfaith dialogue is because they do not fully understand the benefits of it. And also some people practice it and make mistakes in it. So for example, we need to make sure that before we as Muslims enter into this interfaith dialogue and working with people of other religions that we at least understand the basics of our own faith because if we do not understand the basics of our own faith, then we do not have anything to give when we talk to people of other religions. Another mistake which many people make is that they pretend that we all believe the same thing. This is not the nature of interfaith dialogue. Strong believers are strong enough to talk about their differences. And in fact, Allah Most High tells us, قُلْ O oh, people of the book, come, ta'alu. In fact, this is the responsibility of Muslims. We should be the people who are inviting the others and telling them, ta'alu. You come to us. Let us receive you. Let us host this interfaith event. Let us host this dialogue. But also we have to understand the etiquette. And when you speak with them, with people of other religions, of other faiths, speak with them and debate with them with, in a way which is most excellent. We're not coming together so we can argue about our faith. We can discuss our differences and we can discuss our differences with respect. Because our Quran from the beginning to the end talks about these differences. Our Quran educates us about Christianity. Our Quran educates us about Jews. Our Quran educates us about Mushrikeen and all these other people. So we don't pretend that we're all the same. We accept our differences and we can discuss our differences. And for this reason we see that many people who were non-Muslims used to come to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they would ask him questions. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ and they ask you about the soul and they ask you and they ask you and they ask you where was this this was in masjid al nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were coming to the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said go away you're a kafir he didn't say that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said we cannot speak to you we have our faith we have nothing to do with you 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his beautiful face and his beautiful smile and his beautiful words would answer all the questions which these people brought to him. So this is our way. This is the way of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to understand and to respect human beings. Because even though we admit to our differences in our religions and our faith, when we come together for interfaith dialogue, it is respecting and comprehending that people are part of humanity. If we are not brothers and sisters in Islam, then we are brothers and sisters in humanity. We are all from the sons of Adam alayhi salam. And Allah Most High tells us, لَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Allah has ennobled the sons of Adam. Every child of Adam has this amazing potential and this amazing karam from Allah Most High. So Alhamdulillah, to summarize, what we can see is our faith is a faith of peace. And wherever the Muslims reside, they should be ambassadors of peace. They should be the people who bring the benefit to society. They should be the people who carry the light of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as did the first Sahaba to arrive in this country. We should be people of mercy. We should be people of leniency. So much so that when people look at us, they be affected. Because this was the da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes he didn't even have to move his blessed lips, alayhi salatu wasalam. Sometimes he didn't even need to say a word. For example, when he first arrived in al Medina al munawwara one of the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish leaders of Medina, he wanted to see the man who everybody is saying this prophet from Mecca has come. And so he looks and he sees the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what does he say? This is before he's heard the words of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, and I knew that this was not the face of a liar. Sallu ala nabi So what we have is when we become people of wasatiyah, when we become ummatan wasatan, truly a moderate people, people of moderacy, we can have this dialogue. When we have strong faith, we do not fear from other people and we are able to interact with them. When our faith becomes weak and when we do not understand the deen and when we deviate away from the deen, this is when we see the trouble and the death and the murder and the terrorism like what we see in lots of parts of the world today. So we ask Allah Most High to make us people of light and make us lighthouses in our society. We ask Allah Most High to guide us and to guide others through us. We ask Allah Most High to enable us to walk in the footsteps of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to do justice to the inheritance which the Sahaba brought to this land. And we ask Allah Most High to give us good in this life and good in the next life and free us from the fire, the punishment of the fire. All praises due to Allah and may his peace and blessings be upon his Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best of all those who call to Allah. Thank you.